Working on CRTs can be dangerous and if not lethal. You should not attempt to open up or fix any CRT without having good understanding of safety precautions. I am not responsible for any harm or damage done to anyone or anything. After all, this video is just a visual diary of my progress. And finally, if you have epilepsy or photosensitivity, I do not recommend you watch this video. The 240p test suite by developer Artemio has been the single best homebrew application for retro gamers that are still rocking a CRT. With expensive pattern generators as the alternative, the test suite has given means to CRT enthusiasts like myself to dial in a display using our retro consoles. There's a lot you can tell about the state of a CRT by revealing defects that are only obvious when displaying grid patterns and colour bars. I found myself constantly pulling out a console from the setup when buying a monitor to help make an informed decision. So much so that I looked into revisions of the test suite that could output from a portable console. Apart from the Sega Nomad and Turbo Express, certain revisions of the PSP can also output 240p analog video to a TV. PSP games are windowed when output through component, but PlayStation 1 games emulated on the PSP display in 240p full screen. So I just needed to convert an existing test suite that'll work on the original PlayStation. There was discussion on shmups about putting the NES version of the test suite through the PS1's NES emulator and converting that into a PSP compatible eBoot. Whoa, that's like an emulator inside of an emulator. I tried this out myself and added all the 240p revisions into the emulator and then converted the ISO to eBoot using the PSX to PSP program and included some artwork for finishing touches. The test suite ran fine for the most part, which I'll soon show, but I also looked into making a working eBoot of the PS1 test suite. I ran into the same black screen issue that was reported on the Shmups forum, where members tried converting the PS1's binary file themselves. But then I found Philip Alex X station port of the test suite that's been made compatible for PS1 emulators. As PlayStation games run in software on the PSP, I converted this version of the test suite to eBoot. So this here is the PS1's 240p test suite ported to the Sony PlayStation Portable. Before showing what this software can do on the PSP, I'll go through a real scenario of just how useful the test patterns are to calibrate this CRT, a TIAC CT-M686SR. There's a basic OSD, but I couldn't see any mention of a service menu in the schematic, so I'll need to perform all adjustments manually. It's much easier removing the TV's rear case with the set lying on its face, which is totally safe as long as you rest it on something like a thick towel or a yoga mat for padding. Ah, that vintage CRT aroma brings me right back to 1997. I'm using the test suite ROM for the Sega Mega Drive, and my modified PAL console outputs a sub 60Hz vertical frequency, hence the scrolling black bars captured on camera which aren't there in person. My go-to test pattern is the static grid, which helped me pick up the pincushion effect that drags out the corners like the sides of a pillow being squeezed. So after adjusting the pin amp, I increased the horizontal size and moved the grid to the center, and with the exception of a slight anti-clockwise rotation, it's a pretty respectable grid now. When I went back to the main menu, everything was looking oddly blue, which I confirmed using the color bar screen, where red and green were missing from columns one and two. I increased their gains on the neckboard until they just appeared in the first column to correct the white balance. Dialing in the TAC to look this good wouldn't have been anywhere near as achievable without the 240p test suite, and it's equally useful to help unveil any problems when buying a CRT. And in this scenario, it's usually advised to bring along a console that can run the test suite, whether that's by a flash card or a CD backup. If you don't have a console that plays backups with a flash card, you could always use a hacked Nintendo Wii. But imagine taking all of this to the seller's house. You're carrying the console, sensor bar, video cable, power supply and remote. Any other console and you can at least omit the sensor bar, but that's still four pieces to lug around. And condensing this down to just two items, the console and video cable, can make the process a lot more convenient. The two eBoots for the PSP can be downloaded by the link in the description, and you'll also need to install custom firmware. To output 240p using a 3000 or Go model, select the interlaced option in the TV out settings. 
Compared to the PlayStation 1 in RGB, the PSP's component video is lacking just a bit in sharpness, which could arguably make convergence adjustments less than ideal if using the PSP to display calibration patterns. Nevertheless, this is a game changer for testing component enabled CRTs on the go. I don't have composite cables as they're oddly more expensive than the aftermarket with component, but they should still work. The December 2020 revision of the emulator-friendly PlayStation 1 test suite is slightly outdated by not including Keith Rainey's monoscope pattern or full convergence color grids. The main pattern I find useful to run a CRT through its paces start with the solid white screen. Simultaneously firing all three electron guns stress test the power supply to scope for underlying power issues. And during that 10 seconds I also look for burn-in and if no odd behavior or loud noises, then I display the solid RGB screens to look for purity defects. The static grid shows you a number of things from the HV size and position and pin cushion defects which are usually fixed in the service menu or in the case of the TIAC internally. Not all CRTs are going to have a service menu adjustment for rotation, trapezium or skew which unfortunately needs to be fixed by repositioning the yoke. Next is the grid scroll test to identify linearity issues, which manifests as inward warping lines. This mimics the scrolling of 2D gameplay, so if it shows up here, then chances are you'll notice it when playing good old Mario. But don't get too caught up if it's not in the direct path of the main character. I normally end my testing with convergence to see if the RGB phosphors line up uniformly. I find this convergence pattern lacking, and thankfully the NES version of the test suite has been updated to include more robust patterns from RGB squares, hashed grid, dots and stars. It's even got Keith's monoscope pattern that's a step above helping to adjust linearity compared to the old circle pattern found on the PS1's test suite. Most of the test patterns as a whole display without issue, which is a testament to both Damien Yerrick for porting the test suite to the NES and Alan Blomquist who wrote the It Might Be NES emulator back in 2000. The only real hiccup I ran into were the video scroll patterns, where the green hill zone was a complete glitch fest, and the vertical scroll was far less problematic, but started often enough to make this kinda useless. Luckily the grid scroll test ran just fine though. The NES has a reduced colour palette compared to the PS1, but I'll likely fall back on this test suite solely for convergence. There's some other handheld consoles that can display on a TV in 240p, but they were lacking in grunt to run the full test suite version without compromises. The Nintendo DS Lite with an NDS TV mod can output 240p NTSC composite video. The mod requires fine soldering, so it's not going to be too accessible to most. SNES and Mega Drive emulators can be played on an R4 flash cart to run their versions of the 240p test suite but the video gets scaled to fit the DS's 256 by 192 screen, which messes up the patterns beyond the point of being useful. Just look at how the grid barely fits the screen and shimmers in the grid scroll test. So I'd give the modified DS as a test pattern generator a miss. With native composite and RGB video that's equivalent to a Mega Drive home console, the Sega Nomad is possibly the best portable test suite console in my opinion. But with today's market asking four to five hundred dollars for a stock unit, I can use Sega's predating handheld instead. Tim Worthington's Game Gear TV Out mod upgrades the console to output 60Hz composite, S video, and RGB. I'm running the somewhat feature lacking version of the Sega Master System test ROM using a Game Gear EverDrive. It's got the meat and potato test patterns, I'd say enough to at least diagnose an obvious fault even if the grid pattern isn't to the full height of the TV. It's still a worthy alternative to the expensive Sega Nomad, and would be useful for a brief test if the CRT doesn't have component inputs for the superior test patterns on the PSP. I'm going a little off track here, but I might as well show the rest of the mods that turn this Game Gear into a Nomad Lite. I soldered a Game Gear controller adapter to the console button pads, to which I've connected a 2.4 GHz wireless receiver. I found these 8 bit Doom Mega Drive controllers to be very reliable in that they don't need to be resynchronized, so I can just trust to leave it in there. A second controller can be plugged into the link port using an aftermarket adapter, 
which I further modified to wire power and ground signals to use the Sega Phaser. But Sega Master System light gun games assign the Phaser to Player 1, to which you need to patch the ROM to swap Player 1 and 2 ports. It's a lot of hurdles to go through, but once it's all running, it's a pretty unique experience playing Operation Wolf using a real Sega Game Gear. Between the PS1's test suite and using the NES emulator to complement convergence and monoscope patterns, the PSP will be my portable pattern generator of choice when testing a CRT with component inputs. In the end, I recommend using whatever you have available that's convenient to run the 240p test suite when diagnosing, calibrating or buying a CRT. And just remember, take the test suite with you only to try out before buying, not for on the spot fixes. So leave your CRT toolkit at home and try not to bother poor old Betty. Hey, would you happen to have a spare power outlet? What are those things for? Oh, that's a uh, dielectric grease in my degaussing wand. You brought blue banner wand. Oh my, it's been such a long time.